This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. Our Military History Night for April the 13th featured Vancouver historian Dr. Jeff Jackson with a comparative discussion of how the British and Canadian armies of World War I faced the task of turning raw recruits into fighting units. He explores the theme by focusing on the British 62nd and Canadian 4th Divisions, both on the Western Front. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to RCMI Military History Night. My name is Patricia Hine White, organizer of this event. Wednesday, April 13th, 2022. And this presentation will be videotaped for educational purposes. There will be a question and answer period following this presentation for our Zoom participants. And uh, please mute, mute your mic and uh, hold your questions until that time. Guest speaker, Dr. Jeff Jackson and his topic, the British 62nd and the Canadian 4th Division. Our speaker earned his PhD from the University of Calgary in 2013. He teaches at Mount Royal University in the Humanities Department. He has published numerous articles in the field of strategic studies and the author of two books, The Empire on the Western Front and The War Diaries of David Watson. And our uh, um, speaker has um, don't, kindly donated one of his, his book, uh, the, On the Western Front, to RCMI Library. Thank you very, very much. It'll be very much appreciated. And um, when Great Britain and the Dominions declared war in Germany in August 1914, they were faced with the formidable challenge of transforming masses of untrained civilian soldiers at home and abroad into competent, coordinated fighting divisions. This lecture focuses on the development of two units, Britain's 62nd, 2nd West Riding Division and the Canadian 4th Division, and to show how the British Expeditionary Force rose to this challenge by turning the spotlight on army form formation at the divisional level, and also to call upon into question existing accounts that emphasize the differences between imperial and domestic dominion ar armies. So with that, uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome, Jeff, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I wanna sort of thank the uh, Royal Canadian Military Institute for having me here to give this presentation. Yeah, so as Pat said, and it's from my book looking at how did we raise these multi-hundred thousand man armies from a largely a volunteer force? And how did we get them up to being good enough to fight on the Western Front? Now, this book covers from the beginning of both these divisions being raised to the end of the war. And it's a study of what differences there was with between a British and Canadian division and how similar was it because they all fell under the umbrella of the British Expeditionary Force. However, I don't have time to go through a whole book today in 45 minutes. So I'm gonna be looking at Vimy Ridge um, or the Battle of Arras, which Vimy Ridge is part of. Now, the two divisions that are looked at is the British 62nd Division and the Canadian 4th Division. The reason why I picked those two divisions was largely because they were raised at the same time, the one in Canada, another one in the United Kingdom, but they're both on the Western Front at the same time and would have a similar experience from 1917 when they entered the Western Front till the end of the war, 1918, to see how much of a difference there was. And when we're looking at the Battle of Arras, this is a great one for Canadians to look at because there has been dozens of books written on Vimy Ridge. And there is this idea or this expectation that we were the shock troops of the British Empire and that there was a reason we were really, really good. And Vimy Ridge shows why we were really good. And I absolutely agree with that. However, the more interesting for me, or the question I wanted to analyze is, why were both these volunteer forces 
why is there a difference? What made Canadians exceptional? And um, that's what we will be looking at. The Canadian Fourth Division will see fighting um, at the beginning of the Battle of Arras. Battle of Arras will actually last for about six weeks. And the British 62nd will have a very different experience and see fighting at the end of the Battle of Arras. So before we could get into what these divisions are doing here, I'm gonna set the scene a bit on what's going on, why this battle's happening, why are we sending in largely raw troops to fight in this absolutely epic war? So by 1917, the war had been going on for since 1914. It's two years. We are run out of professional soldiers. We have these volunteer forces that are coming up, and now we're doing the heavy lifting. That said, the expectation is every year in the First World War, it was going to be the last year of the war. The other side had to be tired. They had to be exhausted. The resources had to have run out. This is going to come to an end. As one German officer said, uh, moving into uh, the 1917, the war is a struggle between two Welsh children, the Germanic against the Anglo-Saxon. One must win, the other must perish. Uh, this photo here is of uh, Canadian troops firing on Jimmy Ridge. All right. So, as I just said, the Battle of Arras would last from 9th of April to the 17th of May. Canadians would attack on the 9th of April to the north of the Battle of, or a northern part of the Battle of Arras. This Though the Canadians would only see fighting for about five days, this would cost 159,000 casualties. It's an astronomical number. It's a daily rate of over 4,000 a day. No matter how good you are in the First World War, nothing will come easy. Given the freedom of choice as well, Field Marshal Haig, the commander of the British Expeditionary Force, did not want to fight here. He had all the logistics, he had all the equipment, he had roads and railways that worked a lot better at Ypres. Why they'll go there and fight the Third Battle of Ypres, Passchendaele later in the summer. However, because the Germans, had, sorry, because the French had been so hammered by the Germans at Verdun, suffering over 400,000 casualties over a span of 11 months, the French lines were close to a uh, mutinying against their government, they needed to take the pressure off and they needed to do it closer to the French lines. The Russians at this point as well were supposed to be launching an offensive in the east. However, by 1917, they were falling apart. And in February of 1917, they said they could launch no offensives. And this is at the beginning of what will become the Russian Revolution. The French under Neville, a new commander, said they were going to launch an attack at the Battle of Arras in conjunction with them, uh, with the British. However, they also pulled out or limited their offensive. So Haig, who was only launching this attack to help that his allies, still decided to go forward with the attack. So this was not going to be any sort of strategic breakout, nor did they expect it to be. They were there to put the pressure off or pull the pressure off of their allies. Um, these are, uh, this is a picture of Canadians digging in on uh, Vimy Ridge after just taking it. So this is now, we've set the scenes. We know the Battle of Arras is going to happen. We have a sort of broad understanding of why it's going to happen. What I'm interested in is how did the Canadians prepare for the Battle of Arras? And what did they do differently than another division, the British, prepare for the Battle of Arras, the 62nd? Why was there those differences? And what was going to be uh, the consequences of them? So I'll look at what the Canadians did first. I'll go through what the British 62nd Division did. And then I'll compare um, both of them at the end of the lecture. All right. So... Something that had not been done in 1914 and 1915, something that had been done in the aftermath of the Battle of the Somme in 1916, was codifying how divisions would fight. 
basically coming out with training manuals on what the expectation for training was within these divisions and what should be going through. Up to 1916, in the Battle of the Somme, this was not done. Now, one of the questions that might be asked at the end is, why not? It seems pretty obvious to us 105 years later that this sort of standardized training would seem self-evident. That said, you have to remember the British Expeditionary Force, which was largely a military garrison strung out throughout their colonies, was brought together as this expeditionary force. It was six divisions. And within an 18-month period, it's going to be over 65 divisions. And it's going to be fighting a very different style of warfare than what those six divisions had been trained for in 1912, 1913. So there was no standardization, and they had to learn lessons on the Western Front about what worked, what didn't work, why this worked, and then apply it. And that doesn't really hit till the Battle of uh, the Somme and the aftermath of that with the creation of the training directorate. Um, and then there's all these booklets that come out about every minute little aspect of it. Um, I would never encourage you to read it because it's pretty crazy, like the detail that they go into and what they expect the division to train and then what they expect the brigade to train, what they expect the battalion to train, what they expect the company to train. This at the higher levels brigade and division did not exist before uh, the Battle of the Somme in any meaningful manner. What was decided in these training manuals was a methodical set piece attack that very much relied on heavy artillery fire. And the Canadians and the Canadian 4th Division are going to be training like any of the other Canadian divisions and like any of the other British divisions. So the training documents, the training that they're going through has been standardized at this time and they're all doing the same thing, all right? Training-wise, when they're put into battle, they're gonna have different expectations as this will show. Uh, this is another picture of uh, Canadian gunners firing on Vimy Ridge. All right. In 1917, the Canadian Corps, led by Julian Bing at this time, is not the elite formation that will have its name for in 1918. They had defended themselves ably at the Second Battle of Ypres. They had about as much success as any other British divisions at the Battle of the Somme, but they hadn't had any breakout victories that would say this is an elite formation within the BF. This is going to change with the uh, Battle of Vimy Ridge, uh, Battle of Hill 70 and Lawns, and at Passchendaele in 1917. And this talk is going to look at why it changes at Vimy Ridge. So the one thing that the Canadian Corps and the 4th Division within it is given is time. They decide at the Santilli Conference in November 1916 that this tack is going to go in in the spring of 1917. From there, Julian Bing's told the Canadian Corps will be attacking Vimy Ridge. So in January till April, they have three and a half months, basically, to prepare for this attack. And they're going to go through the same training manuals codified to do it. They decide that this is going to be a very limited offensive. There's going to be four colored lines. Once they get to the last of the color lines, that's it. They're stopping. There's going to be no strategic breakthrough. There's going to be no thought that maybe we could bring cavalry in if we open up the lines and rush forward. No, nope. limited rolling barrage. Canadians will keep up with that rolling barrage. Once they get to the fourth colored line, they are going to stop. Now, the Canadian fourth division start at the south and north first division, the one that's been there longest at the south to the north, uh, the Canadian fourth division, which is new to the Western Front. Um, saw the tail end of fighting at the Battle of the Somme, but largely has not been on the Western Front for any period of time. Interestingly, and I have not been able to find out why, I've, uh, I've emailed a lot of my colleagues that study this as well. I've tried to go through all the papers about why it is the 4th Division is given the hardest area to attack. Though they're the most junior uh, division 
on the Western Front um, within the Canadians. They're given, they have to attack Hill 145 and the Pimple, the most challenging geographical feature on it. And I don't know why they're given that other than it just goes one, two, three, four. However, fourth division gets the hardest match. Um, their divisional commander is David Watson. Uh, he was a journalist and an editor of uh, the Quebec Chronicle. Um, it was a conservative political mouthpiece in Quebec. It was an Anglophone paper. So though Quebec City at this time is the fourth largest city in Canada, which I find crazy uh, looking back in the 21st century. And it is the largest English speaking paper within Quebec City. It's not incredibly prominent outside of Quebec City. That said, he made the right friends with Sir Sam Hughes, with Beaverbrook. Um, he shows that he's an able uh, colonel um, at the Second Battle of Eat, and he is promoted. And because the Canadian Corps is going from this idea of one division of 20,000 to over 100,000, he's seen as able, he has the right political peerage. He is commanding the 4th Division at this point. The German defenders at Vimy Ridge are going to be in a lot tougher situation than in other areas of the Battle for Ras. If they lose Vimy Ridge, they're not going to be able to, sorry, they're not going to be able to send in reinforcements. That said, Vimy Ridge is a very defensible place, but because it's on a ridge and it drops off the other side, reinforcements can't get back up there as quickly as possible. The reserve divisions of uh, German forces were 24 kilometers away. Um, Canadian artillery is going to be absolutely hammering Vimy Ridge um, in the weeks leading up to it. And it's also heavily reinforced with British artillery. So this is not just a Canadian attack going in. Uh, they start shelling Vimy Ridge itself on March 20th. And for the next 19, 20 days, constantly shelling it, uh, sending over 1.6 million shells onto Vimy Ridge. As um, one officer said, Whereas the ground of the Somme battlefield appeared to suffer from smallpox, Vimy Ridge had the conclusion of the bombardment had confluent smallpox. This area was absolutely hammered. All right. So another thing that is going to change that comes from these training manuals I was talking about at the beginning of this lecture were they were going to have different sections. Instead of having jack of all trade soldiers that could do everything, they were going to make specific units that would be going there. They were going to make large scale um, models of what they would be um, fighting and what ground they would be taking. Unlike in previous instance, all the troops would be walking through this. This is one of the ones on Vimy Ridge and showing where they were going, what their objective was. So that every soldier from the private to the major general knew very clearly where they were going, what their goal was, what they were going to achieve, and they were going to stop. There was communication through all levels of what's going on, and there was as well 40,000 trench maps handed out, something that would not have been done in 1916, 15, or 14, showing exactly where their lines were and where they would be stopping. There's also going to be application of new technology, bringing in uh, new artillery, bringing in new mortars, um, switching to uh, the Lee Enfield, which happened uh, previously, and stuff, technology like that. So this attack was very sophisticated. It was using all the latest technology and know-how, absolutely. That said, the Canadians, are not yet doing anything differently than what other British Expeditionary Force divisions would have access to. All right, so because they had a lot of time to prepare for the attack on Vimy Ridge, there's going to be tunnel excavations. They're going to have 12 subways bringing troops up under forward 
so that they wouldn't get ground down on top of the land. Immense raiding leading up to the assault, constantly raiding. This would have its pluses and minuses. Uh, one raid on uh, March 1st, uh, Canadians within the 4th Division launched a raid that was probably the biggest failure in raiding that the Canadians would launch. Um, I forget off the top of my head, but it's close to a thousand casualties, Canadian casualties were suffered. The gas was launched poorly. It blew back on the Canadians that were attacking. It didn't get to the German lines and it led to a disaster. That said, this idea or this art of constantly attacking was there, constantly raiding, constantly putting pressure on the German lines. And this is going to go on for months and months. Also, air battles were fiercely fought by the Royal Flying Corps. And when April 9th happens, uh, the Royal Flying Corps is going to be dominating the air around here. So it's bringing every resource possible to make this attack stick. All right. So we all know the story. On April 9th at 5.30, snowing, sleet, so visibility is bad for the German defenders to see if an attack's coming. The artillery opens up. Canadians blow up mines. They come out of these tunnels. They walk across this land methodically with the rolling barrages, all knowing which lines they have to take, which battalions are going to leapfrog the other battalion at those lines, and the success of Bimmy Ridge 105 years ago today. Um, that said, the Canadian 4th Division did not achieve all of its objectives on the first day. It was the only division out of the four that did not do that. Um, as one war diary of fourth division says, corpses accumulated in form small hills of khaki. On hill 145 and the pimple, incredibly hard fighting, brutal first world fighting where you're stabbing people with your bayonet, very up close and personal. You're sending in all of your brigades, all of your reserve battalions to try and take it. Within these three days of fighting, the Canadians are going to suffer, or the 4th Division is going to suffer, over 3,500 casualties. This Vimy Ridge victory does not come easy. It is not straightforward. But the tactics and training do pay off. They do reach their objectives. And the argument can't be made that there was any way this didn't work. The training was there, and it showed that these were very capable soldiers. All right. That said, when you look at German documents, when you look at what Germans wrote on it, when you look at their war diaries, they did not see the capture of Bimmy Ridge as a loss. All right. They thought that the British, and they would put Canadians under the, the British uh, flag here, they felt that the British could have punched further in, that their reserves were not coming in time, that there was gaps open, that this could have been a lot worse. Um, German conclusions on Bimmy Ridge, that this was a draw at best. The Germans did lose the heights of Bimmy Ridge. They did lose those observation lines that Bimmy Ridge gives you. But they pulled back to what is known as the OP Marycoat line, and they dug in there. They would never get Vimy Ridge back again, but they didn't view it as a disaster. Whereas Canadians view this as a great victory, it absolutely is. The other side of the hill don't view it in the same manner. All right. So, the Battle of Arras for the Canadians, months and months of planning, three days of hard fighting, they've reached their objectives. I didn't go into what happened to Bimmy Reed specifically. If there's questions about it, absolutely. But 
that's not the point of the talk. The point of the talk is to compare one division to another division. All right, so I sort of have given uh, the conclusion away here with a division unprepared. So your question is going to be, why is another division in the British Expeditionary Force unprepared? As I said, um, both volunteer forces, both new to the Western Front. With the Canadian 4th Division, that's not completely accurate as they saw fighting at the tail end of the Battle of the Somme. But there's no two divisions that work out perfectly timeline. This is as close as it gets. The British 62nd Division, also largely a volunteer force with a small cadre of professional soldiers, exactly the same as um, the 4th Division. Um, they enter the Western Front in January of 1917 and February of 1917. So I'm going to go through the same sort of ideas of what 62nd Division, the West Riding Division, was doing and why this led to a failure. So in the aftermath of Bimmy Ridge in April 14, 15, 16, Haig had decided that largely the Battle of Ross had run its course. Like many First World War battles, after the first week, he started grinding to a halt as German defenses stiffen up and vice versa as British or French defenses stiffen up. If you're going to make any headway, other than in 1918, in uh, the last 100 days, it's going to happen within the first week. In view of Sir Douglas Haig's decision to limit the future scope of Arras offensive, preparatory to switching his efforts to Flander, it may appear strange that a fresh attack should be launched by three armies on a frontage of over 22 kilometers. However, this is exactly what is going to happen. The first 60 second is going to be in one of those uh, arms. All right. So at the same time as the Battle of Vimy Ridge is raising, Bullock Hart, if you can see at the bottom of this map here, is happening as well. And the 62nd Division is taking part. However, the sophistication and training that we saw for Vimy Ridge, the preparation, the months and months of planning, the weeks upon weeks of artillery fire, the constant raiding did not happen for Bullecourt. They had not, 62nd Division had not been incorporating new training doctrine like the Canadian 4th Division has. And the reason wasn't that they missed out on it, just that British divisions are going to be used differently. The Canadians were within the Canadian Corps and they wouldn't be moved around. They would always fight within the core of those four divisions. That is not the same for the 62nd Division. Throughout the war, the 62nd Division will be in dozens of different cores and with dozens of different units playing a lot of different roles. That from building roads to launching quick attacks to defending areas, uh, say during the March Offensive of 1918. They're not going to move as a core, they're not going to function as a core, and they're not going to know their fellow divisions that are next to them. Because you have so many different divisions, 65 within the British Expeditionary Force, they're not gonna codify them and put them in one to four. They're gonna move them depending on how the core is doing or what the core is uh, planning to do. Or if one division needs to be pulled out of the line, you're just gonna stick um, another division in there. So they did not have the time to train because they'd been doing a lot of other roles. So the sophistication and training for Bullock Court was not there. The soldiers did not know what their goals were. They did not walk over one-fifth models of Bullock Court. Um, they had not trained on dummy courses, nor were the officers and men clear to the same degree as Canadian 4th Division on what lines to take or why to take it. They cannot, did not have time to incorporate these new lessons. Um, yeah, so 
The British 62nd, I'm going to be looking at their second attack on Bullet Court. They did have the first attack on Bullet Court that happened at the same time as Vimy Ridge. They were supposed to go over with Australian divisions. However, before the night of the attack started, the Australian divisions decided that they weren't going to attack or decided that they couldn't launch this attack. And they told the British 62nd Division 25 minutes after they had launched their attack that they were not going to be attacking. So the British 62nd Division uh, first waves were absolutely wiped out. And there was very hard feelings in the 62nd Division towards the Australians. And if you read uh, the private papers of individuals that were there, they absolutely despise the Australians. Um, I would say, understandably, if I was told that there's going to be people on either front of me going forward in 25 minutes into attack, I was told that there's going to be zero of that support going forward with me. Um, that said, they had been given five days to prepare for this attack, not months. So when they came back out of the line, they were told that they were still going to be holding the line and that there might be another attack coming at Bullet Court. However, they were not going to be training in the same detail. It wasn't necessarily that an attack was going in, so they didn't do that constant raiding that was happening. What they were really trying to do was sort through the amount of casualties they had suffered, try to bring the men out of the line as much as possible to give them a rest. There wasn't this artillery preparation to the same degrees. Though patrols were always constant, the wires were not properly cut, nor was there this impetus from leadership of this happening. The divisional commander of the 62nd Division was Walter Brathwaite. He was GSO-1 um, for Ian Hamilton down at Gallipoli. He was a career soldier. He had fought in Afghanistan. He had fought in Africa. He was a competent leader by all accounts, a professional soldier, gone to a uh, staff college in India. Uh, he thought after Gallipoli disaster that he was done as a commander. However, his wife was friends with Sir Douglas Haig's wife. I have no idea if that favoritism played anything or not. But when the 62nd was raised, uh, their uh, divisional commander was 65 at the time. It was felt that was too old to lead to the Western Front. Brathwaite got called in to be the divisional commander. Uh, this is a picture of the shelling of uh, Bullet Corp. All right. So, as one soldier in the 62nd said, the savages are now contesting every inch of ground with desperation, but Tommy is more than a match for Fritz. A long cons consultation with General Brathwaite this evening. I think we have considered every eventuality, every possible move on the chessboard. This officer here, writing in his diary, sounds very confident about what's about to happen, all right? However, this sort of preparation is not to the same degree as what the Canadian 4th Division had. The divisions that are attacking on the 62nd Front are Australian. There is very hard feelings with the Australians in the immediate aftermath of this. And this is the immediate aftermath launching the Second Battle of Bullet Court. The divisions that the 62nd will be facing, the 27th Wittenberg Division, was considered one of Germans' elite divisions. The divisions holding Vimy Ridge for the Germans was not considered elite. Um, there was very poor coordination between uh, Corps commanders and division. Banachet, the British Corps commander, sort of took it as self-evident that the 62nd Division would know where to go, what to do, what the objectives were. And he took that as self-evident evidence for the other British divisions on either flank as well as the Australian divisions. So there's not a lot of communications, first of all, between the divisions, and there's not a lot of communications between the division and Corps, something that the Canadian Corps does not have the same issue with. Um, they would be advancing about the same distance as um, the Canadians, 2,400 metres, to the fabled Hindenburg line 
a much more defensive structure than um, what was on uh, Bimmy Ridge. That said, the geography here is a lot flatter um, and less grueling than at Bimmy Ridge. So basically, we have a picture here of where the 62nd Division um, would be uh, launching their attack from and Bullecourt. That's where they had to make it in um, that day um, on May 3rd, 1917. They had to make it to the town there. Now, obviously, this is a picture taken in the 21st century. Um, this would be belts and belts of uh, barbed wire across there, trenches across here, as well as German uh, pillboxes interspersed between there um, and mutual infilade fire going all the way across. As well, the Germans are dug in, have heavy artillery here firing and absolutely hammering the British lines as they've seen what's been going on with the launch of the Battle of Arras on April 9th. They're three weeks into it now. They know that attacks are continuing along this front. All right. So as you could see here by uh, this map down here, I put none of the 62nd brigades or battalions meet any of their objectives. Um, all the brigades failed to make it past the first line of German defenses. So not even where the Canadians got way past the first line. Um, the attack began to crumble almost immediately when junior officers began um, to suffer casualties. Uh, the British 62nd soldiers dug down or went back to the beginning lines. Some uh, officers actually had to whip out the revolver and say, I'm gonna shoot you if you're not moving forward. So pretty desperate times, though none of those officers did. Um, one of them did bring out his uh, revolver to try to um, motivate um, his man was killed by an artillery shell. But it seemed that the morale of the 62nd first, it's the interviews afterwards, after battle reports, uh, interviewing the soldiers said they didn't know where to go. They didn't know where the attack was going. There was no communication about what was going on on their flanks or how this was, attack was going to work. Not all attacks of Bullock Court failed. Um, if you can see to um, the right there, um, to the green, those are Australian battalions. They get a foothold in Bullock Court, but it's very tenuous. And uh, by the end of the day, they have to pull back as well. But they did get through the first line where the 62nd did it. Whereas the Canadian 4th Division in three days of intense fighting suffer 3,400 casualties. Um, the 62nd Division within the first three hours suffer close to that, uh, about 3,000 casualties. Their attack is largely over. All right. So in the aftermath, Generals have to uh, justify what happened, they have to explain what happened, and they have to come up with new strategies. The difficulties of this attack were beyond the capacity of the platoon commanders to control, though many showed great individual gallantry. The individual soldiers left largely to his own initiative, initiative apparently lost all power to exercise it. The result was a failure and a costly failure absolutely poor communication between junior officers and their men, between senior officers and their men, between divisional commanders and their men, between divisional commanders and divisional commanders, and between corps commander and the divisional commanders. There was an overconfidence, both in the 62nd Division and within the 5th Corps, which the British 2nd uh, Division were in, of what was going to happen and why it was going to happen. There was an artillery failure. The guns were not ranged in, nor did they fire the same amount of shells and destroy the land in the same way that happened at Bimmy Ridge. As one officer who fought throughout the First World War said, Second Bullet Court has had the reputation of a killing match, typifying trench warfare at its most murderous. Incomplete training. The attack was launched at night. The Ridge attack was attacked as the sun was coming up. Distance was too far. Um, leadership failed. Other elite British divisions as well 
uh, 52nd and 51st Highland Division also failed to reach their objectives. All right. For the sheer horror of war, Bullecourt could not be surpassed. Never saw a battlefield, including Ypres in 1917, where the living and the unburied dead remained so close for so long. 62nd continued to launch attacks, failure after failure, for another 13 days. The casualties at the end were over 4,000. All right. So throughout my book, so throughout every chapter, I have similar comparables. Not everything could be apples to apples. Sometimes there's apples to oranges, and it's not fair um, to compare what's going on. All right. One thing you can compare is results. Did the Canadian 4th Division take their goals? Yes, it took three days, but they got very rich. Did the British uh, take uh, bullet cart? No, they could not do that. Preparation time. One had four months to prepare. The other one had five days. So that sort of training or that, um, that was needed is not there. Artillery support, once again, not similar. British 62nd got a lot less artillery support. Um, soldiers' knowledge, also not there. Goes to the training, goes to what the goals are, objectives are. The Canadian 4th Division got a lot more than the British 62nd. Um, leadership, the leadership with the Canadians seems a lot stronger than what uh, the British 62nd had in May of 1917. German forces, uh, the divisions as Germans ranked them at the bullet court, they were a lot better divisions than what the German divisions were at uh, Bimmy Ridge. It goes back again to how are these divisions going to be used? The Canadians are lucky to be within the Canadian Corps under that leadership with strong leadership, but also not being used piecemeal to fit into a jigsaw puzzle. The 62nd throughout the First World War is going to be moved from one uh, corps to another corps and just sort of plopped in and expected to roll with what's happening. The Canadian Corps will never have that sort of rapid reaction where they have to launch an attack without preparatory time, especially uh, 1917 after. All right, that is my talk. I think I'm pretty close to 45 minutes. Um, do you have any questions at all? I got two in the audience here. I'll, I'll take the first one, yeah. If I may, um, you didn't get into the training. You said they're working basically off the same thing. Yeah. But was, were there different attitudes in the way those were applied between the British force and the Canadian force? It doesn't seem that there was different attitudes. The 62nd didn't get time to train for bullet court, obviously. But when they have to rebuild after, uh, after this in the summer of 1917, and they do do the same training. When the Canadians are training in uh, the summer of 1917 before Lawns and Hill 70, and you're looking at the uh, British 62nd training, they're doing the same things, basically the same time on each of the days. But the British are going to be training, and then they have to go build a road, and then they go to a new corps, and they have to do that. Whereas Canadians are going to be settled somewhere in the line for months on end, where they still have to do all that other stuff as well, but it's in the same area and they do get to train and they get that stability there. Um, yeah, they have the same manuals and it's not that Canadians are going off the books, they are training to what the manual says. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. The um, Canadians fourth division had about 14 months for back. Yeah. By the time yeah. So the 62nd had the same sort of long shelf period. They're, they're actually raised in 1915, but they're, um, they're put on coastal guarding and they're not giving proper equipment or um, uniforms. They have wooden guns basically that they're training on. They have some uh, old machine guns that are not uh, uh, Lewis guns or Vicar guns. I think they're Colt machine guns. Uh, but they only have like one per brigade. So they're not getting proper training. They're on a pretty shoestring um, 
uh, regime, uh, they're thinking that they're going to actually break up the 62nd Division. So all their good officers are got, get go for replacements for casualties. They're sort of like a holding division that we have these troops will hold here. If we need them, we'll go. And then late 1916, it's just decided, nope, we're going to actually send this division whole to the Western Front. I, I saw a question there, but then it disappeared again. I'm on the zoom, just wait, try to go down chat. Um, did Australians resent the British general because of Gallipoli? Yeah, I'm sure they did, but um, I, I haven't read any documents that the Australians were not going to um, play nice because of that. Um, when I look at um, when I look at uh, documents of Australians in the neighboring uh, divisions. Um, they do apologize afterwards and say we did a pretty raw deal. Um, the GSO-1 of, uh, of the 62nd Division actually goes on to become Governor General in Australia. So I find that fascinating. So there's, I guess there wasn't that many hard feelings there. Because it's interesting because he has uh, diaries and his diaries are interesting up to when he goes to Australia. And then he changes his tunes about Australia as he becomes a Governor General. But um, yeah, no, there doesn't seem to be at that level, hard feelings, but yeah, um, the Australians do apologize after the fact. And if you read the official history written by Edmonds, um, he does mention that the uh, Australians should have uh, done more, but it's one sentence in a book of thousands of pages where it says like, because of miscommunication or misunderstanding, the 62nd went ahead without any. Um, next question. Um, how many rounds with Canadian heavy hatters have gone through in a day in the Vimy Barrage? I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, so I do apologize. I don't want to guess because this is being documented. So I'm sorry, I'll be like, well, he's way off. Um, but I do have in my book, uh, Empire on the Western Front. So I encourage you to take a look at that. <laughs> sorry. Are those all the questions? Yeah. So the 67, yeah. 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 That is, they, they did learn. Um, so they're not going to fight at the third battle beat because uh, they're still rebuilding because of the casualties they suffered. But they're brought in in November of 1917 to fight at Cambrai. And they're the British division that gets the furthest until the tanks break down there. Then they're used um, during the German March offensive, they're punched into a lot of holes. And then during, um, during uh, the summer of 1918, they uh, see fighting um, at the Second Battle of the Marne um, with American forces. And then they're brought up for the last 100 days. So we're the Canadians fight at uh, Third Battle of Ypres. So similar to uh, the British at uh, Six Second at uh, Cambrai. Canadians get a break from October till August 8th, whereas the British 62nd Division fights at Cambrai, fights, fights at the March Offensive, so fights the summer, and then fights in 100 days as well. Um, and they see more fighting in the 100 days than the Canadians do. I actually went through the 100 days and counted how many days of actual combat there is. And the 62nd Division is not a standout division in the sense that this is an exceptional but they absolutely do achieve every goal that they're given moving forward from Bullwood Court. They don't make a name for themselves like a Canadian divisions do in the Canadian Corps, but I suspect it could be that they're just moving from one division to another, so there's not this homogeneous idea of one nation moving forward. They're in 13 different corps between Bullwood Court and when they finish the war. Yeah, um, Tony, that's a great uh, question or analysis. Um, yeah, because they did limit the advance to the top of Vimy, and there was no breakthrough beyond that. So that's where the Germans come up with this idea that it wasn't a loss. Um, and there's a great paper uh, written on it in a Canadian military history journal. Um, it's a free academic journal that you could access. Just look at the German perspective of Vimy Ridge. And it goes into detail on how the Germans said it. And it's from a 
historian that's gone through all of the uh, German primary documents looking at it. So it's a fantastic resource if you want more. Yeah, um, and there's another question. Perhaps 62nd were given worse jobs because best divisions being used to enhance chance of victory against lesser German troops. Yeah, that was an interesting idea that I had as well to save the shock forces for that. And that's exactly what happened with the Canadians. Both divisions at the beginning of 1917, I looked at just the Battle of Arras, were about 20,000 troops. By 1918, because of casualties, uh, British Division had actually shrunk to 15,000 troops, whereas Canadian Corps broke up the 5th Division, and a Canadian uh, Division actually grew to 25,000 troops. So there's about a 10,000 troop difference between the two divisions in 1918. So when you're using a Canadian Division, it's packing a more significant punch just because it has 10,000 more troops. Now, when you look at uh, British Division 62nd, to say the 51st Highlander um, Division, who was seen as one of the exceptional divisions of the First World War, and you look at what they did or how they were used, it's very similar. Um, and it, the goals that they achieve or how they achieve it are also very similar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think something is uh, through the picture. Yeah. The uh, fourth division on the left end of the, the ridge yeah. had the hardest time. Yeah. 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 My, my understanding is that one of the battalions uh, raised by the Canadian Grenadier Guards in Montreal, their commanding officer did not want the artillery in front because he thought that would make it very hard to get through. Consequently, the Germans were ready for, in that point, yeah. and uh, the battalion suffered very high casualties compared to the ones on either side. I, I have not heard that when, um, and I did look at all the battalions specifically just to see what they said. But when I look at the brigade artillery plans, uh, 11th, 12th, and 10th, they're, they're shelling everything. So it doesn't seem that there's a gap or area that uh, a colonel would have uh, gone around. Um, one thing that Bing was very good at and that Curry was also very good at was knowing the plans. And I mean this as a positive, micromanaging all the plans to know that there's a consistency in a format to them that is uh, all the same. Um, all right, next question here, sorry. Um, communication, good at all levels. Uh, 25 or less. Um, they, uh, they had great communication. Um, they had runners that knew where to go. They were using all different tools. They had great spotters in planes when the planes were flying. Um, and the Canadians at Vimy Ridge especially had amazing logistics. Now, one of the things that I like to look at is Canadians were great at Vimy Ridge, but they had four months to prepare. When you look at Canadians in the last hundred days when they're fighting at Amiens and then they're moved to another area and they're moved to another area and they have to take the Hindenburg lines or they have to take the Canal du Nord and they haven't had months of training on these lines, they're still great at communication. They have become very proficient at launching these large set piece battles very rapidly. And the argument back could be, well, the German defenses aren't that good anymore. The German morale is not that good anymore. These are still the Hindenburg line. There's still machine gun posts. There's still people manning all these. And yet the Canadians put it together. So the Canadians in 1917, I think, are at the beginning of their learning curve as a core on how to use it effectively. And Canadians were held back to be used to shock troops because of how robust uh, their divisions were. Um, yeah, is that any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you on Zoom for joining me. I have really um, enjoyed having this opportunity. I just want to thank the Royal Canadian Military Institute again for giving me this opportunity. And um, thank you for joining me this evening. Uh, good night. Thank you very much, Jeff, for a, a truly amazing in-depth analysis uh, presentation from a time in history of which now there's no living accounts or witnesses. Yeah. And say war is hell and whole generations both side were either lost or maimed for life yeah. so uh, it's um it really brings it home you know really war is hell now at this time i would like to present you with a gift of appreciation but um i'm unable to do so so <laughs> I'll call upon 
ask CMI Vice President Mike Clary to do to present your thank you gift for me. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> it's very kind of you. And thank, thank you, you very for much. Me. Wonderful talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very, very much, Jeff. Um, and I so at this time, I would like to uh, thank the behind the scenes uh, team of RCMI for their support this evening, without which this presentation would not be possible. Thank you all. And a special thank you to our Zoom host, Thanuja, and Eric Morse, who along with his numerous other RCMI responsibilities, produces the RCMI event videos. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for, for your participation. And thank you once again, Jeff, for a, a truly outstanding presentation. And I wish you a safe journey home to uh, beautiful British Columbia. And uh, I now declare this meeting ended. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.